Lord, you're worthy. Yeah, you're worthy. Yeah, you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. I know a lot of times, you know, we'll say a lot of the phrases over and over. Thank you. You can be seated. It's awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thank you, praise team, man. You lead us. It's amazing what you do. Woo! And I know a lot of times, uh, you know, we say, man, we sing that same phrase. Well, that's just because we don't want you to be thinking about what you're singing. You know the words, and your heart can go, and your spirit can go to those places where that, where that's, that's just coming out of you. You know, it's just using that as a phrase to just begin to focus on what God's doing on the inside, what you're saying to the Lord. If you think that's something, think about this. We'll be introduced in the book of Revelation to a set of of uh, what the Bible calls uh, thrones and elders, and there's 24 of them, and then there's some that are designated around the throne of God. You'll get to see them in this fifth, in the fifth chapter, uh, yeah. and and you know what their job is? Day and night, they bow before the throne of God. Here, here, here here's what they do: they bow, they bow, and then they and then they take off their crowns and they cast them at His feet, yeah. and they just worship and day and night. When you get to heaven, you won't have to worry who these people are or how to identify them because as you walk around heaven, it'll be easy to tell who they are. But they're the ones with those flat foreheads. You know, I mean, if you see a flat forehead, you say, I bet you're one of the elders, aren't you? Yeah, because <laughs> you bow day and night in the presence of God and cast your crown. It's just amazing. You get to see some of the most amazing things that you've ever seen or heard about as we go into the book of Revelation, which we're headed right into. Believe me. Everything that I talk about today, what I talked about last week, all of these things will be revealed. You'll get lots of insight into it. I know the Holy Spirit will open it up and do more than I can do now. It's just amazing when, when you say, Lord, we want to be revealed. We want you to reveal this, which is what the book of Revelation is about. The book of Revelation is not about spooky theology. It's not trying to hide something from you by painting it in pictures that you cannot understand. Everybody say, God wants me to understand. Yeah, just keep that in mind that God wrote the book of Revelation through John the Apostle, through a human being. He wrote it so that he could reveal to us what we needed to know about those days to come, what shall be hereafter. And what Ezekiel saw, and what Daniel saw, and what Zechariah saw, and Zephaniah, and Amos, and Habakkuk, and Nahum, what all of these, uh, the ancient writings of Ezekiel the prophet, what was a mystery to them is not a mystery to John because God has opened up. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ezekiel, the book of Daniel especially, and you'll see a passage today out of Daniel 12, where God, Daniel is seeing stuff, and all of a sudden God said, whoa, wait a minute, close the book up. Don't write anything else because this is not for the time you're in. Just seal it up right now. And then Daniel's going to say, well, okay, God, I, I really would love to keep on writing about this, and I'm seeing these things. And God said, whoa, write it, uh, you know, shut down the book because this generation you're writing to won't even know what you're talking about. They're not the ones going through it anyway. They don't need to know about it. They won't understand it. Shut it up. And, uh, and then Daniel says, well, knowledge is, people are running to and fro, and knowledge is increasing. You know, I mean, it's almost like he had to get one more little sentence in before he really shut it down. Because he really wants to talk about it, but God won't let him talk about it. And it gets sealed down until John is taken by the Spirit into heaven on the Isle of Patmos. And then God said, all right, all that stuff we shut down, you know, a thousand years ago in the Old Testament because those guys didn't need to know about it. Well, they do need to know about it now. So I'm going to open it up and you write it down and I'm going to show you the things which shall be hereafter because the generation that, ha- that, that studies your word is going to know what you're talking about and they're going to need to know what you're talking about. So I'm going to open up my spirit of revelation unveiling to that generation. And here we are and we are that generation. Just look at your neighbor and say, God's talking to you. He's talking to you. I mean, this is not a mysterious book that is not intended to be understood. It is intended, and you can understand it because the Spirit of God is going to give you the ability for me not only to talk about it and to see it, but for you to understand what's going on in this world we're living in because God believes we need to know this. 
And what is the revelation about? Is it about mysteries and craziness and these weird uh, uh, vignettes of action? No. Jesus says in the first chapter, this in the first actual verse, the revelation of Jesus Christ. In the first verse, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what's the book about? It's not the revelation of end times. It's not the revelation of weird pictures. It's not the revelation of the devil, not the revelation of John, not the revelation of the acts of the Holy Spirit. It is the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. So you say, what's the book about? The book's about Jesus. It's really not about the weird, crazy Antichrist and the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven vials that are poured out. It's not about the millennial kingdom and the tribulation and the thousand-year millennium and about the end of everything. It's really the book is revealing Jesus Christ. What's Jesus doing while all this is going on? What's Jesus doing to reveal himself? What is Jesus doing at the end of everything? Is he doing what he said he would do? Is he, is he, is he, is he sitting on a throne of his father David in the city of Jerusalem and ruling and reigning for a thousand years? Is Jesus true to his word, what he said? I mean, that is what the book of Revelation is about. Show me Jesus and show me what Jesus is doing in all of this. And so as we move through Revelation, what you should be looking for is what does this say about Jesus? How does this reveal Jesus? Is Jesus who he said he is? Is he going to do what he said he was going to do? Keep your eye on Jesus. He's the center of the world. He's the center of the universe. He's the focus of everything. And so the book is going to talk about some unique things. Yeah, and the reason why is because you, how would you describe it? I mean, think about it. I, I, I'll write, I think the notes you'll get in a couple of weeks because next week will be, our, will be our youth Sunday, our children's Sunday. But in a couple of weeks, in the little preface on the outline, I, you know, I hate to tell you what it is before we get there, but... But I, was, I just asked you a question at the, in the introduction on a paragraph on this outline you'll get. As we start in chapter 4, let's suppose you were a member of the Aborigine tribe in Australia. And you know, these are the native tribes that have never been out of the backwoods of Australia. I mean, these are guys that have never seen a city. These are guys that have never been anywhere but in the backwoods of Australia. I mean, regardless of... Uh, uh, what what was it, the movie, uh, the, the guy, uh, it just slipped out of my mind. I, I can remember all kind of Bible stuff, but sometimes. Uh, Crocodile Dundee. Yeah, yeah, thank you, bud. The Crocodile Dundee. Um, in the, you know, you see these Aborigine in Crocodile Dundee, they just look like they're from the backwoods, but they really are like college-trained people. Well, how many of you know that that that's not really the real picture, that Aborigine people that are original, they have never been out of the old back, and they don't know anything about modern technology, modern science, or anything. And just suppose you brought an Aborigine to America and let him live here a year and then sent him back to his people, and then he was wanting to try to tell his people what America was like. Imagine, how would, you've never seen a microwave oven, neither have they seen a microwave oven. How would you describe a microwave oven to somebody who had no idea what you were talking about? How would you describe an automobile, especially at night with its light shining and the red on the back and the light on the front? How would you describe that to people that have never even seen a chariot, much less an automobile? How would you describe modern weapons of warfare with fire coming out and, and smoke and fire coming? I mean, how would you describe that? This is the trouble that God has in showing us heaven and heavenly things. The, 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 the writers that God is using earthly like John and Daniel and Nahum and Ezekiel and, and Zephaniah and Zechariah and all of these people are looking at things that they don't even know what they're seeing and they know that the people they're writing to will have no concept of what they're saying. So they're just trying to reach and grab images and symbols and pictures of what that could be so that when you hear it, you'll pop some kind of symbol or thought in your mind about, okay, I guess what it's like, you know. 
So, you know, a fiery flame-throwing tank missile becomes a chariot with a mouth of fire, you know, and out of his wings it shoots electricity. I mean, what, whatever the description might be. So in Revelation, we're introduced to like some weird symbols, but they're only weird because you have to remember that this was written to some people who have never seen any of this stuff and by a writer who knows that and saying, how can I describe this crazy stuff I'm seeing? I don't even know what it is. And I know when I write them, they're going to go, what is this? So I have to try to use a symbol that will be as close so they can get some concept of what I'm even talking about. So a lot of these symbols are not difficult to understand as long as you keep in mind to whom this was written. I mean, everything has a context, guys. Come on. I mean, don't try to use a, you know, 2018 context to something that was written to, you know, people 70 A.D. or 100 A.D. A lot of difference between what you know and what they know. And so part of understanding prophecy is not to try to put some modern-day spin on it. It's to think, who was this written to and how would they have received this? And so let me try to understand it considering who it was written to. Yeah, yeah. So Revelation becomes not quite so, you know, closed up if you just keep that thought in mind. That's just, that was one thing that can really help you gravitate and grasp this. But anyway, let me move on. With all of that said, and last week, and I am got to go because I got nine of these, and I know, you know, uh, I, don't, I can't lag over. We're going to get plenty of this, believe me. You're going to be, by the time we get through the next uh, 13, 14 chapters or so, you'll be going, oh, my goodness, you know. But anyway, remember last week I shared with you, in case you weren't here or didn't get it written down, that the first sign, and the the message is basically, Pastor, why do you believe that Jesus could come at any moment? Is there any reason to believe this? Is this just something you feel in your heart, or is there a Bible reason why you believe this? Well, if it was only something that I felt in my heart, then that would be one thing, although I really do feel this. But if the Bible talks about things that have to be in place clearly, prophetically, then that means that until those things happen, there's no possible way Jesus is going to come back. Because people have been preaching about the return of the Lord ever since he left this earth. The Apostle Paul said he felt like he was going to be alive when Jesus returned. The Apostle Paul said that. I believe the Holy Spirit puts that thought in our mind because it helps keep us pure, or it should, because if I believe Jesus could come at any moment, my life's going to be affected by that, right? Because I believe if he could come at any moment, it's going to bring a certain amount of purity in me because I don't want him to come and here I am, you know, robbing a bank or stealing something, committing adultery, being disobedient to parents or lying about... I mean, I don't want to come and him catch me in the middle of being sinful and wicked. I mean, there's just a certain amount of, of purity in that. It's, a, it's an accountability issue is what it is. So I believe the Holy Spirit puts that thought in us to help keep us accountable to the things of God. Now, if you tell me you believe Jesus could come at any moment and your life is unrestricted by that, I'm going to say either you need to be in a mental institution or you're, you're, you're not telling the truth. You really don't believe that. Or, you, you, you know, somehow the cylinders aren't firing right up here. So with all that said, I'm just saying to you that there are real reasons, not just fantasy thoughts about it. And no matter what somebody said 50 years ago, 70 years ago, there were certain things that were not in place, and there was no way Jesus is coming again. If the Bible says this has to be true, then this has to be true. I don't care how much you want it or how much you think about it or how close some of these things are to looking like this. If it's not there, then it can't happen unless God's going to not be true to his word. And my goodness, for thousands of years, everything God said had to happen, had to happen before it happened. I know that's kind of goofy sounding, but that's the truth. So in other words, just as an example, 
May 14, 1948, and we'll talk about that in a minute, the nation Israel became a nation again. I'm not going to talk much about it at the moment, but just to show you an illustration of what I'm talking about. Before May 14, 1948, the apple of God's eye, the fig tree, as it's called in the New Testament, had not even, was not even a nation. Israel did not exist, except in the hearts and minds of those that longed to go back to Israel. There was no nation of Israel. Israel quit being a nation in 70 AD when Titus, the Roman general, marched out, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, did not leave one stone upon another, plowed the grounds with salt, sowed the land with salt so nothing would grow again, and didn't leave one stone upon the other of the temple. The Jews ran for their life, and they'd never been a nation again. They scattered to the four corners of the earth, all over the earth, and there was no nation of Israel. Israel has to be a nation. They have to be in place before any of the stuff prophetically that God said was going to happen can happen. Without a nation of Israel, none of that prophecy stuff that happens in Revelation can happen. So before May 14th, 1948, I don't care who preached about it, how much they wanted it or whatever, it wasn't going to happen. Why? Because what needed to be in place wasn't in place yet. Well, now it is. And many of these things I talk about are, are, are also like that. They had to be in place, and they now are in place. Everybody say, it could happen now. It could happen now. I'm telling you, it could happen now because all these ten things the Bible says must be true, and I just wanted you to see what they are. So we started with the rise of doubters and skeptics, which just means uh, the very fact that people are so goofy and ignorant, and, and they're deception and deceivers and ignorance and scoffers, and they're willingly ignorant. I read the passage last week. Let's move on to number two. Get the, get, the, get the video from last week. Go on YouTube. Go to Facebook. YouTube has everything, by the way. Just click on Freedom River Church. You can Every sermon I preach for the last however long we've been on air, two years, whatever it might be, you can look at every message individually right there and just kind of refresh yourself if you need to. But number two, uh, the increase in knowledge and travel. That is one of the things that is true just before Jesus comes. Now, let me just show it to you in the Scripture. Here's Daniel in chapter 12 that I mentioned a moment ago. Chapter 12 is the last chapter of Daniel. So he's been through all of these prophecies. He's been through all of the fiery furnace and the lion's den, and he's talked about the, the 1,250 days. I mean, he's talked about the last three and a half years of tribulation. He's talked about all of these prophetic things and right at the last bit of the chapter, this, this really is in the last chapter that he writes. It's kind of like a little summary, and he's kind of winding down and so forth. And then, and then this is what God says. He's been talking about things, and it looks like Daniel's about to start talking about things that are going to happen in the last days. He's kind of moving toward that. If you read chapter 12, the first three verses, you go, uh-oh, Daniel's fixing to say something about the last days. Because he's been talking about these numberings of days and years, and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be three and a half years of this and 42 months of that, which is three and a half years, and it's going to be horrible, and three and a half is going to be good, and three and a half is going to be bad. He's moving right towards saying, and here's what's going to happen. And then God says, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal up the book. Everybody say, what book? The book you're going to see in chapter 5. The one that's got all these seals on it. It's not really a book. It's a scroll. You'll see it. And it has seals on it to keep it bound up. And it's written on the back and front, which means it's full of revelation. <laughs> it just shows you how meticulous God is. It's not just written on the front side. It's written on the back side. And it's got these seals. And as you break one seal, a certain amount will roll out. And you can say, oh, my Lord. oh what!" And then when it breaks another seal, now more is shown. And third seal, and more is shown. But God says, don't tell them anymore because they don't need to know it. They're not going through it. It'll just confuse them. There's no, there's no relevance to it for this generation. We'll open it up later, but right now, shut it up until the time of the end. And then Daniel says, it's almost like Daniel just kind of has a peep on his heart, and he just says, oh, men shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Oh. It's almost like a little blurt that comes out of his mouth. What is he saying about the end time? Men shall run to and fro. What does that mean? It means there's an increase in 
travel of people. There's an, there's an ease of moving from one place to another. Men will run to and fro. What will be, be true about the last days? This transportation, this flying all over the world. You could leave Gulfport right here, fly to England or fly to France. Or I mean, I took a plane uh, out of, uh, where, 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 did you, where did we fly? Out of uh, New Orleans, maybe, I think it was. And we, went, we flew over uh, to London, and then we flew over Baghdad, and all we landed in the Middle East. We didn't get off the plane. They wouldn't let us get off the plane, but they refueled it, and then we flew into Delhi, India. Took us like 22 hours, something like that. So I went from Gulfport, Mississippi to Delhi, India. I'm there in 22 hours. I'm halfway around the world in 22 hours. I'm able to run to and fro, and so are you. And we do it all the time. We jump in our automobiles and, and leave here and drive 12 hours, and we're, you know, 1,000 miles away or more. You know, just a, unbelievable. We're unrestricted by where we want to go. This is not something that was possible in those days. But we just take it for granted. It's so common for us, and that's one of the signs of the time. Men will be able to run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And I don't have to talk a lot about knowledge. You guys are sitting right here now with a device in your hand or maybe even a wristwatch that has a screen on it, and you just hit the right icon or press the right search button or whatever, and you have all the knowledge of the world right in your hand. You can type in anything and be there in a moment. I can be in the library in Jerusalem right now studying things that are thousands of years old just by touching the right icon or the right button. When I say something to you, many, not many, but some of you immediately start a search. Well, let's see if Pastor said it true. Yeah. Or I'm interested in that. Let me just make sure that that was right. Hey, it makes it hard to preach to people nowadays. You know Why? Because you could miss it years ago. You could kind of miss it a little bit. Maybe you had a little fuzzy memory or something, and you said something wrong, and nobody would be the wiser, really. Not that you wanted to say things wrong, but, you know, you didn't have to be so explicitly right on everything. Nowadays, boy, you say something wrong, somebody, well, wait a minute. No, that ain't right. It was 10 years before that. I mean, you know, we have knowledge. I wrote in your outline that, before 1900, um, the 1800s and, and between, many archaeologists, and this might, this might surprise you, many archaeologists who do the digs and the remains and all of that kind of stuff say that the generation of Abraham was more advanced than all of those generations between Abraham and 1800. But at the turn of the century, the 1900s, like 1910, 1908, blah, 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 uh, old man Mercedes, whoever, I can't remember his first name, and uh, developed an automobile like 1901, 1902. He created an automobile, an ancient model, 1908. Henry Ford comes along in the early, like 1919, 1918. Uh, they developed the assembly line, and T models come off. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, we've all, what, what I'm saying to you is starting in the 1900s, uh, we went from the horse and buggy to the, to the, to the uh, fast, sleek, modern automobile to rocket travel, rocket ships, um, man on the moon talking about going into Mars and blah, blah, whatever that is. I mean, we've redefined death, you know. I mean, we change body parts and we, and we put somebody else's heart in somebody and a liver here and above, and then we can put you on a machine and even though your spirit is gone, which I think personally that your spirit's already with God, but your old body can be kept alive indefinitely. Some machine beating your heart and blowing in your lungs and blah, blah. But the point being that the knowledge that we have is unbelievable. And with all of the technology and with all of the everything, and now we're looking at artificial intelligence and we're looking at a robot being able to imitate and become us, so to speak, and think for themselves and blah, blah. It is amazing. Back in the 80s, I heard uh, scientists speak about 50% of all the knowledge that has ever been accumulated in the history of the world was accumulated in the last 30 years. That was back in the 80s. Now we're, you know, 2018, probably 90% of everything that's been known from the beginning of the world till now 
we have discovered in the last 50 years for sure. Think about that. Almost 100% more we know now than they did just 50 years ago. I'm just saying, how fast does knowledge have to expand? This was necessary, according to the prophet of Daniel, before the end. We surely have that now. My goodness. Look at reason number three, the lukewarm church. Now, I talked to you about the lukewarm church. Remember the church that's neither hot nor cold? Remember the church at Laodicea, the last of the seven letters? And God said, this church is so lukewarm. This church is so wishy-washy. This church won't preach about sin anymore. This church won't condemn things that the Bible condemns. You know why? Because it might hurt somebody's feeling. I'll guarantee you that as, as hard-headed as I am and as... And as uh, uh, non non uh, uh, politically correct as I tend to be, I'm still restricted somewhat because we got these cameras in here going out everywhere, and because you're sitting here, I'm not trying to hurt you. I don't want to say things that are going to be damaging to you because you may have somebody in your family that's homosexual or or, uh, or, or some other per, prefer, uh, perversion in life or some kind of uh, somebody who thinks in some transgender or somebody. I mean, all these goofy, crazy things the Bible clearly condemns. I won't say anything negative, abortion, all that kind of stuff, because you may be sitting here, you already feel guilty enough about that. I'm not trying to pour guilt on guilt. I mean, I'm just saying that these are things that the Bible talks about and that's one of the reasons we need a Savior because we're so, we're so bound by sin and our lives are so ruled by perversion and all of that kind of stuff that the Bible is the only book in the world that says that stuff is not right. But we won't talk about it because it, you know somebody hears it and then it hurts somebody's feeling and then they say to their family, your preacher's mean and blah, blah. And then all of a sudden half the people or a third of the people leave here because I say something that's politically incorrect. Don't think that's not restricting. I mean, you're sitting up here in some denominations with women pastors. And I love women. You know I love women more than men, right? Right? And I believe in women. And if it weren't for the women in the church, I don't know what we would do. Our church has, we have women's children's pastors. We have will, women praise leaders. We have women that help in every form of ministry and with child care and with leading classes and stuff like that, but they're not the pastor. They're working under the authority of the head, like the Bible describes that there's a certain order and a certain pattern, and this is what you're supposed to do. So here's a church led by a woman that the Scripture clearly says is not scriptural and godly. But because you can't get enough men in these watered-down denominations to step to the forefront, you got to use what you got. So you have lesbians and homosexuals and everything else, women leading congregations, clearly not biblical. And they're not going to preach against anything like that so that people will know that that's not God's order. Watered-down, wishy-washy, go-along-to-get-along theology produces a church that God says, you make me sick. You make me want to vomit. And I'll vomit you out of my life. That's a sign of the time. That's the state of the church in the last days. And it doesn't mean every individual church is like this. It doesn't mean every individual is like this. It just means that's the spirit of the age. And you might find it hard to believe because you don't go to a church like that, that there are churches like that. And I'm just saying to you that there are far more churches like that than there are churches that are hot with the heart of God. And we should praise God and thank God that we're not a church like that. And it makes it difficult. Don't tell me that I don't feel pressure to conform to that kind of thought pattern. And some of the things that I've said today could go viral or whatever. And uh, who knows? There might be some protesters out in front of our church saying, ah, he hates women and he's a homophobe and he's a blah, blah, blah. 
I mean, you know that kind of stuff. And when you stand against something like that, no matter how sweet you try to be about it, in general, you try to be about it. Heaven knows. Can, can we be honest for a minute? Look, I have homosexuals in my family. I have some I've grown up with all of my life. I'm not talking about my son or daughter or even my, any of my grandchildren as far as I know. But I have aunts and uncles and nephews and nieces and I, and some of them are lesbians or homosexuals. Yeah, everybody does, right? Now, God love them. Now, not, I'm, don't, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, I don't know what God's going to do about that because I'm not in management. I'm in sales. I'm not the one who decides, okay, how does this reconcile and what does God do with this? I'm, I'm not the one who decides all that. So I'm not trying to be condemning. I'm just telling you what the Bible says about about the way life will be in the years right when the Lord comes. So I love them. I interact with them. I'm not afraid that they're going to make me a homosexual. Just because you have a family member, it doesn't mean it's going to rub off on you. You know, it's not a disease that you can catch, you know. They're not trying to make me be one. So, hey, you know, go with where you are and let's see if God, the Holy Spirit, will convict. Because it's God who changes people's lives. It's not us. I don't care. Quit arguing about it. Quit being mean to people. You're not responsible for somebody else. Just love like God says love and let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit does and everybody's going to be all right because God knows what needs to happen and how it needs to happen. And, you know, he's the author of life and salvation and he's the one that decides, not me. So quit putting pressure on yourself and try, trying to be the all-convicting one. Say to this, I resign as general manager of the universe. That means you're not in charge. There you go. Relax and love people and be sweet and gentle to them like the Bible talks about and patient with them and allow God to do what only God can do, not you. Quit, quit condemning people. So anyway, that, I don't know how I got off on that. Oh, the lukewarm church, that'll do it. Yeah, that'll do it. We talk a lot about that. Let's move on. Number three, the rebirth of the nation of Israel. And I started talking about this a few moments ago, but let me just say this to you. The rebirth of the nation of Israel happened in 1948. I believe that it is the greatest miracle of the 20th century, our past century. There were lots of things that happened in the 20th century. I gave you a list two weeks ago in an outline that listed about 12 big gigantic things like the, the introduction of the microprocessor in 1971 that made... The little, the little computer you have at home possible. Before 1971, they had these giant computers. I used to wire them when I was an electrician. They would have a room this big filled with computers with those spools that went, and they had to sit up on floors about a foot and a half off the ground because they created so much heat. They had to have floors they set up on, and then they had to have their own power panel because they took so much power, you couldn't have them running on the same power with the bank or the institution that they were in because they drew so much power and they spun and reeled and blah, 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 blah. you got you got a, a thousand times more processing in that little watch you're wearing than all they did in a whole room full of this stuff so in 1971 the microprocessor was introduced which made it possible for you to have the little desk computer and blah blah everything was made smaller smaller blah, 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 blah. that's a miracle buddy but the rebirth of the nation of Israel is a bigger miracle than that in 1993, TCP, IP, which was called back then, and Al Gore had nothing to do with it, by the way. That lying joker. I don't know how people get away with telling such ridiculous lies. But in 1993, uh, a group of American scientists created a network, and back then it was called the Network of Networks, that's how it started off, the network of networks. They, they, they invented and created a process for a network of networks to be networked together, which later became the Internet. Before 1993, no Internet. Yeah, how did we ever make it? 
And, and, and it wasn't the Russians and it wasn't the Afghanis and it wasn't the Venezuelans and it wasn't the Indians and it wasn't, it wasn't China. Man, this country is the engine of the world. Everything the world enjoys that's great came out of us. And the world leeches off of us and takes our devices and has a better life. God created this country. You need to respect that. We are not the villains of the world. We are the heroes of the world. Without us, none of this stuff I'm talking about would even exist. That bunch of crackpots down in Venezuela, they can't, even, they can't even have a country, man. Everybody's leaving. That's why we have to build walls on our southern border because everybody wants to come in here. If we're so bad, why don't we have to build walls so nobody can get out? The fact we got to build walls so can't, people can't get in that don't belong here tells you everybody wants to come here. Why? Because we're the heart of the world. We're the greatest country that's ever existed, and God established us, and God ordained us. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All men are created equal, and we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, which include life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in a brief moment of time, we enslaved many of our great people. And then we fought a war to make sure that that didn't happen anymore. The only nation in the history of the world that corrected itself about that kind of philosophy, and we destroyed that, and we've been a nation ever since. A heart, a compassion. I'm just telling you, don't let the propagandists deceive you. America's great because God makes us great. And we might stumble and bumble and do something wrong. And let me just say something else on, on, on behalf of this. I don't care who the leader is. I mean, FDR, Jimmy Carter, John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Ronald Reagan, first Bush, Clinton, second Bush, Obama, Trump. These people have been set up by God. Look, the, the God is the one who rises leaders up and pulls leaders down. It's God who leads this nation, not some person. And when you see what happens, it's not because that person, it's a purpose of God involved in this kind of stuff. So don't get all whacked out about some man. It's God who is leading us. And so we're walking in the purpose of God. And, and, and this country's going through the purpose of God. And world happening and world events are under the hand of God. Pray for your leader. Love your country. Root for the best. Pray for the best. But don't just... Yo, I tell you what would make your life much happier. Do any of you watch the news? All right, quit watching it. Just, just say, okay, for the next two weeks, I'm not watching a bit of news. You'll find out you'll be much happier. You won't be mad all the time about stuff. Get off of Facebook. Man, those goofballs on Facebook, they don't know what's happening. All they know is how they think about it, and then they try to paint it in a way that you'll think like them. Get off of that mess. I mean, hey, declare a quarantine. I'm quarantining myself for the next two weeks off of Facebook and, and whatever, uh, Twitter land or whatever that stuff is. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm not watching one network. Don't even watch anything. Don't listen to Rush or Sean Hannity or anybody. I mean, don't, don't listen. Just, just, just declare it off limits. And just see if your life, and don't listen to any other propaganda show you listen to on radio or whatever it might be. Quit listening to that mess. Those people don't know what they're talking about. They know what might appear. You know, Walter Cronkite. How many of you are old enough to remember Cronkite? Now, I'm talking in the 60s now. Maybe early, yeah, early 70s. You remember what he used to sign off? He was a CBS guy. You remember how he used to sign off? And that's the way it is. No, what I want to say is that's the way it appears. 
That's not the way it is. The way it is is the way God says it is. What you're talking about is how it looks, Walter. That's not how it is. That's what you think it is. But is ain't is until God says it is. In the New Testament, there were a bunch of people that were dead. How is they? Everybody said, they is dead. And then when they stepped into the presence of Jesus, Jesus says, get up and walk. Well, is ain't dead anymore. Until Jesus says a word about it, it ain't is. Is is what God says it is, not what we says it is. And it's never over until God speaks a word about it. So I'm just saying on May 14th, 1948, the greatest miracle in the history of the world happened. In one day, look at this verse out of Isaiah 66. Isaiah didn't really know what he was talking about, but God put it in his spirit. Look at what he said. Who hath heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to give birth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion, everybody say Jerusalem. That's who Zion is, the apple of God's eye, by the way. That's what he says. In the, he calls it the apple of his eye. Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she gave birth to her children. Isaiah is just saying, is it possible for a nation to become a nation in one day? Is that possible? Well, it wasn't before May 14th, 1948. And on one day, Israel became a nation again, raised the flag, and, uh, and, and the star of David flew over the nation. They played the national anthem. They began to speak Hebrew like they did when Jesus was there. Oh, my God. No other nation in the history of the world has ever. Are you listening to me? I'm not talking about in the last 2,000 years, in the last 6,000 years. I'm talking about in the history of the world. No nation has ever, ever lost their homeland, lost their people, lost their language, lost their culture, lost their finances, lost their identity, and has ever come back to be a nation again. No one has ever done that except tiny little Israel, May 14, 19, you know, you know when they lost their land? 70 A.D. 70 A.D. Titus, the Roman general, uh, came in like a plague. This is why Jesus, when he, before he came into the city on the donkey and they waved the palm branches, he looked at the, he was on a hill and he looked at Jerusalem and he started crying. I mean, big crocodile tears. He wasn't just going, oh, yeah. I mean, he's weeping. That's what the word says. And the tears are just flowing and dripping off his cheeks. And he's crying and he's looking at Jerusalem. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you like a mother hen does her chicks under my wings, but you wouldn't get under my wings. And because of this, not one stone is going to be left upon another. When did that happen? 70 AD, Titus, the Roman general, swept in toward the city to shreds. Not one stone left upon another. The Wailing Wall is evidence of the fact, and I've told you this before, the, evident, the Wailing Wall that you see on TV now with the little prayers they stick in it and all that, that was underground. That was foundation stone of the temple of God. Anything on top of the ground does not exist because Titus did not leave one stone on another. The only reason we have the Wailing Wall is because it was underground and it had to be dug out to find the foundation, the wonder wall of the temple of God. That's where the temple stood, but it's gone because just what Jesus said in 70 AD happened. He said it in about 30 AD, about 30 AD and it happened in 70 AD. Just like Jesus said, and since 70 AD, the Jews ran for their life because like Hitler will do in 1948 and so forth, Titus and the Roman government are going to hunt them down and track them down like dogs and animals and kill all of them. And they run in this direction. They run to the four corners of the earth. And they try to become Americans. They try to become Russians. They try to become Europeans. They try to become Australians. They try to become Indians. They try to become, you know, Chinese or Japanese. They, they, try, to, they try to just go into the culture and become part of that culture and forget about Israel. They try to forget about the fact that they're Jewish, that that won't matter. And, and as hard as they try, in every nation they went to, now I want you to listen to this. 
in every nation they went to, they became successful. They became prosperous in that land that they went to. They became productive citizens of the land they went to. They did not become liabilities and welfare patients and, and bums on the street. They became prosperous citizens of the land. It was like the blessing of God is still riding wherever they were. And they tried to be what they were. I'm going to be an American. I'm going to be a German. I'm going to be a Russian. I'm going to be a you know, Japanese, whatever it might be. And forget about Israel. It's gone. But God wouldn't let them forget. The Spirit of God kept them stirred up. And the Zionist moving, movement started around the turn of the century. Theodore Herzl. Uh, Chiam Wiseman, just to give you an example of what happened quickly. I know we're not into history, but, but Chiam Wiseman, who was the first president of Israel, was a chemist. This just shows you how stuff happens and how God's in control of things. In World War I, the British ran out of acetone. Everybody say uh, fingernail polish remover. <laughs> Great Britain needed acetone to make their artillery shells blow up the right way. They ran low on it. Chiam Wiseman, who was a Jew worked as a chemist. He created a way of artificially making acetone in a lab, which now they could have enough acetone and enable Great Britain to fight the war and successfully fire artillery shells. And after, as the war was over, they said, what can we do for Chiam Wiseman? And they said, Wiseman, what can we do for you? And he said, let's give Israel a homeland. And then Arthur Balfour in the Parliament of Great Britain said, I want to make a declaration. And here's the declaration, and it's called the Balfour Declaration, where Great Britain voted in their parliament, let's give Israel a homeland. Because all of that land was owned by Great Britain. And, and Britain gave them a little tiny piece of land. And all the Jews all over the world, all of a sudden, their heart began to go boom, 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 boom. Holy Ghost. God has given us a homeland. Let's go back. Let's go back. And the days that followed that, I know 400,000 were placed in old B-52 bombers from the United States of America. And they took the American flag off of it and put the flag of the United Nations. So in case one of those planes got shot down, which they were trying to shoot them down because the Arabs didn't want them back there, so that we would not be in an international war because they shot an American plane down. But it was our old B-52 bombers. They loaded up with 400,000 Jewish people from all over the world to fly them back into the tiny little spot. And they had to fly them over everybody around them that hated them. And Douglas MacArthur, you know, the great general, you know what his comment was? Never in the history of the world have I ever seen so many people taken so many places and not one of them even got sick. I'm just telling you it's miraculous. And God did this. And that had to be in place because all of these events that happened in Revelation happened around the city of Jerusalem and in the land of Israel. And the Jews have to be in place and the armies have to be marshaled against them. And I'm just saying before May 14th, 1948, Jesus was not coming back because there was no land of Israel. But it is now and he can come back. There's going to be a lot more said. Let me, let, me, let me show you this one because I like what it says. This is Jeremiah's prophecy. But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from the lands uh, and from all the lands where they had uh, driven them, for I will bring them back into their land, which I give to their fathers. This is Jeremiah the prophet saying this thousands of years before it happened. Behold, watch this now. I will send many fishermen, says the Lord, and they shall fish them. What does a fisherman do? You're a fisherman. What do you do? You throw a lure into the water and you entice the fish to bite the lure. So what is he saying? I'm going to send him, them people who will entice them to come back into the land. Theodore Herzl that started the Zionist movement. Chiam Wiseman, who was the first president of Israel. Uh, others, uh, uh, Ben Guren, others were fishermen. They just started painting a vision and saying nice things. Come back, come back. And making people long to come back. <coughs> Popping the lure. <coughs> enticing them. Come back home. Come back home. Everybody says, if there was an Israel, I'd go back home. My fishermen. Notice what else. And afterward, I will send for 
many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. So what did God say he's going to do to get Israel back in its homeland? There's going to be enticers. Woo, come on, follow the lure. Come on back to the land. And they're going to be hunters. Adolf Hitler was a hunter. Adolf Hitler was somebody who hunted them and shot at them. What do hunters do? Hunters stalk their prey and boom, and shoot, shoot them, and the prey flees because they don't want the hunter. To. So God says, here's how I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to give people that will entice them, and then I'm going to give people that chase them and hunt them so they'll have to come back into the land. I'm just wanting you to see and have respect for what, that God knows what's happening. And that all these world events are not hanging on what some crackpot may think at the next moment. Little Rocket Man and all of that mess. And Putin, by the way. Those people don't control what happened on this earth. They are puppets in the hand of God. They think they're in charge, but God is in charge. Don't worry about it. And so God said, that's the way it's going to happen. And you know what? That's exactly the way it happened. This, is, uh, this just gives you a little respect for God. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? This is, this is in Psalms. David, King David wrote this. The kings of the earth shall set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. Everybody say the UN, uh, League of Nations, NATO. Who cares about NATO? Ridiculous. You think NATO's in charge of the world? God says you can set the kings of the earth. You can get rulers to take counsel together against the Lord, against the anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heaven laughs. In other words, God sees these puny meetings and these resolutions and blah, 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 and whatever the propaganda wants to put out to the earth, and this is horrible, and the earth's going to die, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, God says, you know, when I see that, you know what I do? Ah, you are ridiculous. He laughs, and he holds them in derision. You ignorant idiots. And he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Everybody say, I'm going to set up a throne in Jerusalem for my, for my Savior to sit on. And you're not ever going to destroy Jerusalem. And you're not ever going to conquer the city of Zion. And you're not going to stand in my way. I don't care if everybody in the world goes there to stop me. I'm going to do this because you're not powerful enough to stop me. And it's been written that Jesus is going to sit on the throne of his father David, which is in the city of Jerusalem, and rule for a thousand years at the end of the tribulation. And that's what's going to happen. No matter what Putin says, no matter what General Chi says, no matter what uh, uh, the Iron Mullahs and blah, blah, no matter what uh, Donald Trump or Barack Obama or anybody else says or the president of the UN or some ambassador, no matter what they say, God laughs at them. He says, you puny ants, thinking you're going to rule the world? How audaciously prideful and arrogant are you to think you've got some control? You're puppets. And he says, these things are going to take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words by no means will pass away. Holy smokes. It just makes you relax. Let me give you this one. I, I need to give them to you, but I'm not going to preach all of them, okay? Can you relax a second? I know it's time to go, man. The Presbyterians are already there beating the pan. Jerusalem is no longer under Gentile control. It happened, this happened, the event, uh, an, event, an event happened, December the 6th, 2017. Do you remember what that event was? Donald Trump, President of the United States, said, and I, I mean, it's ridiculous that anybody would have to say this. It's just, I mean, just loony land. The three or four presidents before President Trump said, one of the things I'm going to do if I get elected is I'm going to make, I'm going to make it J Jerusalem. We're going to set up the United States Embassy in Jerusalem and, and acknowledge Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. First place, I didn't know that we hadn't acknowledged Israel. I mean, we had our embassy. Let me tell you what cowards we are. And not only us, but a bunch of lands, Great Britain and France and Germany, all, all these other weakling nations of the world. 
they all had their embassies set up in a city called Tel Aviv because it was too threatening. It was too, too much of an insult to our Arab friends. If we set our embassies in Jerusalem, it'd be like slapping them in the face and saying, we're acknowledging Israel has the right to exist. And even though you want to kill them, we're saying, we think that this is where God wants them. We weren't bold. We weren't strong. We were weaklings leading from behind. And it, did, and it wasn't Obama. He did it, but it wasn't him. Uh, Clinton did it. Bush did it. I'm not sure Ronald Reagan probably even did it. Kennedy did it. Nobody our nation, our embassy was in Tel Aviv. I think Israel has the right to say what its capital is. Hello? And that we build an embassy in the capital, whatever Israel says the capital is. Well, we finally did that. But it happened in 2000, December the 6th, 2017, say seven months ago. Now, what that means is that for the first time ever, Jerusalem is really acknowledged as the capital of Israel. And that's important because according to everything God says in prophecy, Jerusalem belongs to the Jews. It's acknowledged as the capital and everything that happens. Listen, you know, let me just say this and, and I'm, I'm quitting. I, I'll just have to stop there. But, uh, you know, I mean, I told you I can preach 45 minutes on every one of these easily. But here's the point. The fight over Jerusalem. Now, this just sounds ridiculous. I know it does. But if you look at it, it not only historically is this way, politically is this way, and realistically is this way right now, Israel's in the news every day. I mean, somebody's always wanting to attack Israel and to destroy Israel and say bad things against Israel. In the United Nations, as an example. Now, kid, just follow this. Think about the derision. Think about the looniness, that it's, the delusion. You know, one of the second signs was intense deception in the final days. All right, think about this. And I'm going to tell you. Now, think about this. And you can look it up on your TikTok or whatever it is and find it. There have been something like, there's a council in the UN which is responsible for human rights violations. That means like killing people, enslaving people, uh, beating people, uh, doing evil things to people. Do you know that there are nations on the earth right now that have slaves? That people that they beat people, they kill their own people, they gas their people, they line them up at a ditch and shoot them and pour them in there and cover them up. Genocide everywhere. There were more Christians killed in 2018 than in all the history of the world put together. Being a Christian in a lot of lands makes you an endangered species. We got that crackpot in Venezuela down there that's murdering his own people and starving them to death. And he sits up in a palace eating steak and everybody else is on the street uh, uh, emaciated and blah, blah and trying to run to America. And he's killing them before they can get to America because it's ridiculous now, I would say those are human rights violations, wouldn't you? There's only one nation on the earth that treats people the way we treat people. It's Israel. Israel is a, is a land that has to protect itself, but it's not cruel. It's not, you know, I mean, it doesn't do evil things like that. It's had stuff like that perpetrated against it, but it doesn't do things like that. Do you know that in the United Nations Council on, on, uh, uh, on Human uh, Involvement or on Human, uh, uh, what was, what's the word? It slipped, it slipped my mind. Anyway, on, on the committee that's, that's designed to bring proclamations and attention to human uh, disarmament, I mean, human dismemberment and all those kind of things, the Council on Human Affairs, they have had about 96 resolutions this past year. You know how many of those resolutions go against, against any of those other crazy nations doing terrible things? Zero. There's 90, there are probably 95 of them are against Israel, and about three of them are against us. 
The only two nations on the face of the earth that do none of that but try to rescue people that are, that's happening to, this, this crazy commission is saying the very ones that are the rescuers are the ones that do it, and the ones that don't do it are to be lauded on this earth. I'm just saying delusion, delusion. I mean, come on, man. It's the twilight zone. So uh, those things are the things that the Bible describes as will be true in these last days. I'm saying these events are signs for you to lift your eyes to the hills from whence cometh your help. Now, you ask me, Pastor, how close are we going to come to the coming of Christ before we get taken out? Now, that's the real question. All I'm saying is, look, things have to be set in order. Stuff that happens in the tribulation period the first year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year, the fifth year, the sixth year, the seventh year, those things that happen during that period of time, they don't just happen overnight. In other words, people don't wake up one day and somebody's able to rule the world. They don't just wake up one day and Israel becomes a nation. They don't wake up one day and Jerusalem is the capital. All of this stuff has to be set up to be in place so it can happen in the future, like God says. So all I'm saying is, if a lot of these things that happen into the future are set up right now, how close does that mean we are to the start of the dominoes that start to fall to make all these things happen? See, the question is, how close are we going to come to the start of all of this before he takes us out of here? What we're seeing is all the pieces lined up. Somebody, God's setting the dominoes up right now. They've been being set up. And at some, mo- at some moment, of an event is going to trigger and all these dominoes are going to start falling rapidly and in succession. And the key to understanding where we are is to remember this. All, a lot of this stuff I've been talking about have been going on for 50 years, 75 years, 100 years. I know people say, oh, that's what they always say. Listen, remember, the key to where we are is intensity. Intensity. Remember what Jesus said? I'm coming. This stuff is going to happen like a thief in the night, like travail comes upon a woman with child. In other words, he's saying, I know all these wars and rumors of wars have always been happening, but keep your, mind, keep your eye when it starts getting worse and worse and it starts getting closer and closer together. The intensity of like, like, like labor pains. When it starts happening like that, buddy, lift up your eyes, pay attention, because I'm about to come get you, you know. I think Jesus could be standing on a cloud right now just waiting for the touch of his Father to say, go get him. I mean, it could be that close. All, everything God said had to be in place is, is in place. It's in the process of being in place. We're seeing it every day. Everything testifies to this. Don't be afraid. The book of Revelation is to take your fear away. God's saying, hey, let me comfort you with some things. This is how it's going to be, and I know you're going to see it, and all of you with a spiritual heart are going to sense it. But I'm in charge. No man is in charge. Quit worrying about all that political mess. It doesn't matter who's in charge. God's in charge. That's what's important. And he sets up rulers and he tears down rulers. The Democrats think they elect people. The Republicans think they elect people. The independents don't even know what they think. (laughs) But I'm just telling you, none of them elect people. God sets them up. Good night, man. Trump is a clear example of that. The man hadn't had one day in the history of his life that he wasn't being criticized, cussed, and vandalized. I mean, even before he even started running for president, much less after that. I mean, good night. How do you explain that? 24-7, negative, 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 kill him, treat him, he's worthless, he's and he's more popular than ever. I know people don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. You know Why? Because God is the one who sets up rulers and tears down rulers. Not us, not CNN, not ABC, MSNBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, or whatever. It's God. And you can trust God. So relax, man. Relax. God's in control. That's what all these things say. 
God says, I got it. Don't worry about it. Live your life. Win people to Christ. Be, be, be gospel-oriented. Just, just love people and win people and try to win more to the kingdom because the end's near and they need to get saved or they're going to go into hell forever. That's what's important. All right, so stand your feet. I'm sorry.